Welcome everyone, my name is Jay Sherman, lifelong Raider fan for over 50 years. Uh, this man cave took me almost a year and many, many, many dollars to complete. Any, play, any player you see on the walls or from when I was growing up, when I be, first became a rabbit fan, uh, every picture of any player from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, I'm holding two helmets here. This is actually the first helmet that the Raiders wore in their first couple of years. When Al Davis took over the team in the early 60s, he was colorblind and he was having a, a problem differentiating his players from opposing teams with these helmets and the uniforms they were wearing back in those days. So that's the primary reason you see the Raider helmets and uniforms as they are today. And just uh, one last thing about helmets, the NFL has come a long way in uh, trying to perfect the helmet to increase player safety, to reduce injuries, concussion, CTE, etc. And there's still work to be done, but they've come a long way. Welcome. Uh, actually, all my friends are equally uh, enjoyable and important to go to these games with. Although none of them are Raider fans, some of them are Jet fans, some are Giant fans, some are not football fans at all. But it's all good because we're all together, getting out of town for a few days, having some good, clean fun, usually. And uh, that's what it's about. Most of these trips I would not have done, not gone on if it was if it wasn't for my friends. So kudos to all of them. It's a tie for first. Hi, my name is Craig Wild. Uh, I met Jay Sherman back in 1976 when he was pledging ZBT fraternity at Hofstra University. I had the privilege of pledging him. Um, and one of the things we did was fill his uh, dorm room with balloons so he couldn't get in at all. He couldn't even open the door. Hi, my name's Ed Bornstein and I'm a Longtime friend of Jay Sherman going back to 1976. We met at Hofstra University. We're fraternity brothers. And 1982, I think, was our first Raiders trip. We've probably been on close to 25 or 30 trips over the years. Uh, lots of great memories. Uh, as you can see, Jay's a huge Raiders fan, and we would typically just go with Jay and root against whoever they root against the Raiders. Whoever they were playing is who we rooted for. Most of the time, Raiders lost, but we always had a great time. Hi, my name is Stephen Christie, and I've been friends with Jay Sherman since 1978. So if I do the math correctly, that's 45 years. I am a fraternity brother, Hofstra ZBT for that period of time, and I call Jay my Good friend for all those years. Hi, my name is Andy Kamer. I've been a friend of Jay Sherman since 1984. I've been to a bunch of uh, Raider, Raider field trips with him. Football is my favorite sport to watch and follow, uh, you know, as far as statistics or any which way. Also, football was my, pretty much my favorite sport to play, other than swimming and paddleball. But during the season, um, you know, football uh, is on my mind quite often. I'm thinking about the Raiders, I'm thinking about other teams in the league how other teams affect the Raiders as far as playoff scenarios. I think about, uh, I think about game matchups, not only with the Raiders, just in general around the league. G 
game matchups, uh, playoff scenarios, um, you know, etc. Where did you have this stuff before this? Most of the stuff. Was it boxes? No, most of the stuff. I ninety-five percent of the stuff I got. The prior house. No, I just oh. got over the le, over oh, the last few months. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Arrested. Arrested. Oh sorry. Oh, sorry. You saw that, right? Arrested. Everyone take one of these later. What is it? It's a um, chronology of every game I've been to with the scores, their all-time record. Uh, well, everyone who I've gone on these trips with, these uh, same core fraternity brothers uh, from Hafsha, my alma mater, uh, they're all equally as important to me. We all enjoy each other's companies. We have, we always have a wonderful time on these trips, and I wouldn't uh, dream of going without any of them. They're all, they all add to the wonderful experience every single time. And uh, if it wasn't for them, I probably would not have gone on most of these trips. And by the way, not one of them is a Raider fan. They're either Jet fans, Giant fans, or not a fan of the sport at all. But we always have a wonderful time together, and that's the way it should be, and that's the way it will be. These are trips no, that we uh, included, including the trips we went on. So everyone take one later. It's good stuff. Huh? I'm going to talk about it later. It's a good story. So look, yeah. What, one of the best trips I've ever been on. Uh, absolutely. There were... Two trips that uh, are actually connected to each other in some way. The first trip was uh, the year that they met in the Super Bowl. It was in 1980. No, 1983. Uh, we show up in front of the stadium at 8 o'clock in the morning for a 1 o'clock game. No one's there. I'm in my car with New York plates that says Raiders with a Z on the end. I'm dressed in my whole garb, and all we see are two gentlemen in front of the stadium, a uniformed policeman and a plain clothes guy. So we approach him, hey guys, where could we get three tickets? It was just three of us. Uh, where could we get three tickets for today's game? Is there a hotel? A hotel in the area, a concierge? Lead us somewhere, we, want, we don't have tickets. The, back in those days, there were no stub hub, no secondary markets, and the game was sold out. So the plain clothes gentleman opens up his jacket, takes out a bunch of tickets, opens it up like a deck of cards. He must have had 100 tickets on him. He gave us three tickets, $25 each, 50 yard line, about five rows off the field behind the Raiders bench. That was the game I was explaining before where they lost 37-35. Unbelievable game. Beautiful, sunny, 80 degrees schmoozing with the players during warm-ups. Wonderful experience. Fast forward three or four years later, the Raiders are in Washington again. Different scenario. I'm not in the car with the New York plates saying Raiders. I'm not dressed up in my garb. I'm in regular street clothes. It's not eight o'clock in the morning. It's about 12 o'clock, an hour before game time, 50,000 people walking around. I took a shuttle with one friend from Newark Airport down to Washington, it was $19 each way. How can you beat it? So we, we took a subway from the airport to the stadium, hundreds of people trying to buy a ticket, not one person trying to sell. So I'm thinking, okay, if we can't find a ticket, it's not the worst thing. We'll find a bar somewhere, watch the game in a bar, and go back to the airport. Not the worst thing. So about 12.30, quarter to one, bingo, there he is the same guy in the plain clothes that sold me the tickets three or four years ago. So my friend says, okay, here's our connection. Let's, let, let's confront him. I said, you know, I'm a little nervous about it. I think he's undercover. Why is he undercover? So I explained the story from three years ago. He gave us the seats right in front of the policeman. Well, why did he sell you the seats three years ago? I said, because he probably felt bad for us. It's eight o'clock in the morning. He saw me dressed up as a Raider, New York plates with, Raider, with Raiders on it. 
and he thought, okay, let's make their day. Let's give them the best seats in the stadium behind the Raider bench. He sold us three tickets, $25 a piece. They make a quick 75 bucks. After the shift is over, they have 75 bucks, the two of them, they can get a nice steak dinner. We can arrest plenty of people later on. That was my thinking. So my friend, ah, you don't know what to talk about. Finally, I caved in. About 10 to one, I decided to do the transaction. Soon as the money and the ticket exchange hands, a plain clothes cop was right behind me and he grabbed me by the wrist and he pulled me into one of these criminal buses down to the precinct, fingerprinted, soliciting on public space, either pay a $50 fine and plead guilty or spend the night in the slammer and have the hearing the next morning. The judge wasn't there then because he's probably at the game. So, so anyway, um, that's what happened. So, oh, little afterthought. I'm in the precinct and we were not the first bus load in. The place was packed with scalpers. And what got me so angry, I wasn't angry because of the predicament I'm in. I thought it was a pretty, pretty cool day, something to remember, something to tell the, the grandkids about. Why was I angry? Because I didn't see my friend. That dog probably got his ticket and he's in the stadium and I'm sitting here. That's why I was so angry. Then about 10 minutes later, I hear a commotion going on. People are laughing. I'm looking around, I'm looking around. Would you know it? Here comes another busload. And my friend was on the next bus. Thank God. So that was my Washington experiences. So a couple of years after the Super Bowl, they started to dip a little, and Belindikoff had just retired. So um, Villabiano speaks to Al Davis, says, says, listen, I think we need Bob Chandler from the Bills. He was a receiver. I think if we get Bob Chandler, right, if we get Bob Chandler, I think we'll get back to the Super Bowl. I think that's the missing link. So fast forward a couple of weeks, Al brings Phil into his office. Great news, we got Bob Chandler. Oh, Phil's face is lighting up. Then there's a, a, then there's a little quiet in the room, and Al tells him, but we traded you to get him. So pack your bags, sorry you're going to Buffalo. So that created a little animosity for a couple of years, but a couple of years, as soon as he retired, he was right back with the Raiders, and he's, his passion for them has been remarkable through the years, very contagious. He's a wonderful storyteller, and he's just a pleasure to listen to, just sharing his stories and just his emotion, how, how much he loved the team and his desire to do well and succeed. Uh, not only made me a fan, but it also, I believe, improved the quality of play of his teammates because his, his style and determination wore off on his teammates and made them a better team. All right. <laughs> Are we all Raider fans? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not today. Wow. Whoa. This is the right Hey, hello. Hello. Hey, 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 hello. Hi, where are you? This is the guy. Oh, happy to meet you. Happy to meet you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so that much for good, coming. Baby. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank this you. Is a special day. Day. I had to see this. I saw the pictures. Yeah. Like, wow. This is, uh, where's Terry at? 
Terry, you gotta take some Terry, pictures of this. Terry. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to get in the way. Hey, Terry. How are you? The Jersey Shore. Raider Blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought you should meet. Absolutely. I gotta start a new. I gotta start a New York, a Long Island booster club. Okay. You got one already going? You start one. No, I didn't. You got to talk to her. I'll speak to you. Nice to meet you. Nice shirt. <laughs> wow, cool. Yeah, we did, we did this. Holy mackerel, look at all this stuff. So you watch the games, are you? I haven't put a TV yet. I just finished it. I even put a few teams yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is, looks like the real deal. Oh, we got to cut the ribbon. Terry, can I Stand together. King's chair. Right. Okay, come here, man. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, we're cutting the ribbon. Now we got it. Look at this guy. This is nuts, man. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, you know, I have to pay my I have to pay my I have to pay my taxes. 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 I have to I've always wanted to meet him. Unfortunately, I was never able to because he played for the Raiders during the 1970s. And although I was a rabbit fan during that decade, I had not yet begun going on road trips. Uh, a lot of times on these road trips, uh, we find out the hotel where the Raiders stay at. And we know on a Saturday night, the night before a game, curfew is like 11 o'clock. So many times we'll get to the hotel around 10, 10, 30. You see a lot of players strolling in. So you, that's a good time to meet them. We would also have breakfast in their hotel on a Sunday morning and get to meet them in the lobby of the hotel on the way to the buses to go to the stadium. But I never had that opportunity to do that with Phil because I was too young to drive, didn't do the road trips yet. So when I finally met him, I was like a kid in the candy store. I was so thrilled to meet him. And, you know, it's not that he was my favorite player while he played, but after he retired, he, his passion for the Raiders was so deep, even, till, even to today. And he's just a wonderful storyteller. And he just lives and dies Raiders. And to hear him give interviews on YouTube or wherever it is. He's just a pleasure to listen to. And when I finally met him, he was so, so nice. Uh, when we left my man cave and we walked over to the restaurant to have lunch, he put his arm around me and he says, you and I are eating so fast. You and I are gonna go to the bar and we're gonna have a couple of beers, just you and I, I wanna get to know you. You know what story I love? When you, when you pulled Al in 79, when you Bob Chandler, and then he traded you for him. Oh my God. That was crazy. How, how was, what was your emotion after that? I was destroyed. Just destroyed. Yeah. I'm sorry I brought it up, but. When John Madden was 50 years old, we all went to Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Big, big Raider dinner in Tahoe. Joey Bishop. Joey Bishop. Remember Joey Bishop? Sure. He was the MC. So they're introducing the Raiders, and there's Joey Bishop, Al Davis, and Al Locasell. So Al Locusel, we're, we're coming, there. we're coming up, and Al Locasell grabs me. He goes, Mr. Davis wants you to tell the trade story. Ah, uh, Bobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have heard the way I did it. And we spent about a half an hour at the bar. Then we sat down at the table. The only bad thing was a lot of the food was already uh, finished by that point, so I didn't eat as much as I wanted to, but who cares? <laughs> so, but that was just an awesome day meeting him. Uh, by the way, just to 
um, make an additional point regarding Phil. Uh, when I met him at the ribbon cutting ceremony to open up my man cave, um, he showed me, right away he showed me his Super Bowl ring from Super Bowl XI. Nice. Uh, Do you want to get into the Sure, sure. Whip. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that almost immediately reminded me of a human interest story regarding him from about 20 years ago. Uh, the Raiders had a home game against the San Diego Chargers, um, I think in 2001 or 2002. Uh, after the Raiders beat the Chargers, um, Phil liked to go in the parking lot and meet with tailgaters before the game, after the game. So he sees a group of guys tailgating after the game. One of the gentlemen, his name was Mitch Ulrich. He was in a wheelchair. He was in a, I believe, a diving accident uh, several months before that. And I don't, I'm not sure the extent of his injuries, but he was in a wheelchair and he accepted his fate and accepted a lifetime being in a wheelchair, unable to walk. Uh, so Phil got around talking with him for a little bit and they exchanged cell phone numbers and Phil told them, listen, I want you to have my Super Bowl ring. I want you to get determined. I want you to walk again. When you walk, when, I, when, when you call me up, when you're able to walk, and at that time you'll give me the ring back. So the gentleman made a makeshift gym in his garage. And after months and months of hard work, he started to slowly walk again. He needed the use of a cane and a walker, but the fact is he was able to get out of the wheelchair and take some beginning steps. And that's when he spoke to Phil, and that's when he returned the ring. And if it wasn't for that exchange, the guy would would have been in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So I just wanted to share that story. You want to you want to bring his own delegation down? Okay. Uh, my first game was October twenty third, nineteen seventy seven. I may not remember what I had for breakfast today, but I certainly remember that day. Uh, the Raiders were the defending Super Bowl champions, and the Jets were not a very good team, so I was expecting good results. Uh, going into the game, the Raiders were four and one, and the Jets were one and four, and the Raiders were favored by two touchdowns. Uh, one play that I remember vividly was uh, at the start of the fourth quarter. Uh, up till that point, things were not going well. The Raiders were being outplayed and losing 27 to 14 at the time. And on the first play of the fourth quarter, the Jets field goal kicker was attempting a short field goal to put the Jets up 30 to 14. And that probably would have put the game out of reach. Uh, back then, there were no two point conversions. So if he made the kick, the Raiders would need three scores in the fourth quarter to win the game. Uh, so luck would have it, he missed the kick. And as a matter of fact, this was the third kick that he missed in that game. So he kept the Raiders in it. To make a long story short, uh, Ken Stabler engineered two 80 yard drives, threw touchdown passes to Fred Blitnikoff and to Mike Ciani and the Raiders pulled it out 28-27. He who laughs last, laughs best. It was a wonderful ride home. So just to make an additional point, years later, I was at the final game ever played at Chase Stadium. Jets were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. And when the second half started, uh, it was like a factory. Everybody was pulling out tools, hammers, screwdrivers, wrenches from their from their jackets disassembling seats to take home as mementos so that was uh that was pretty cool to watch so those were 
uh, my first and last games that I ever saw at Chase Stadium. Oh, that's beautiful. That is very cool. Very cool, right? Yeah. So I, I really, I really. You're a stud there. Oof. I found a little trading card, that, and I had it blown up. That's really good. I would love for you to have it. That was actually. I really enjoyed that picture. That was that was on the cover of. There was remember Sports Illustrated, of course. Then That's a great a, picture. Something else called Sport. The Sport Man. That was on the cover. Like, who'd you who'd you play that, that that day? Do you remember? No, I don't. But but it looks good. <laughs> I don't know where I was, but yeah. yeah. But it looks good. Yeah, that was it fun. Great, man. Yeah, I told you it like that. Long time ago. That's great. You're great. Uh, I've been to roughly 65 stadiums, maybe 70. Uh, approximately half of them were football stadiums. Um, I'd say my least favorite stadium was the Meadowlands uh, because of the brutal ride home. Uh, sometimes the ride home would take longer than the entire game. Um, it wasn't uncommon that a, a ride home would be two and a half and three hours. Uh, my favorite stadiums were, of course, the Oakland Coliseum. Uh, another favorite stadium was Lambeau Field, home of the Green Bay Packers, and that's a very historic stadium. I believe any football fan that enjoys going to games should experience that stadium. Uh, third stadium, uh, which was a favorite of mine was Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. Uh, the stadium is approximately 45 years old now and it's still a beautiful stadium. Extremely well maintained and the reason why I love that stadium in particular was because the Chiefs are the arch rivals to the Raiders and just the atmosphere being in there was kind of special. And they host great tailgates by the way. So, there you have it. Uh, there were a few other stadiums that I enjoyed, which were not Raider related. These were stadiums that uh, I actually played on the field with my children. Uh, some of them were college stadiums, for example, Harvard Stadium, uh, the stadium at Vanderbilt, the stadium at Villanova University, uh, and also one of my best friends Ed um, had connections and he got us to play baseball on the Shea Stadium field and also playing basketball uh, on the Madison Square Garden Court. So those are my best experiences. We just, we just went to, um, two weeks ago, uh, Coach McDaniels invited about uh, 10 or 12 of us. Right. You know, Hendrix, uh, Art yeah. Shell, yeah. Matt Millen, right. yeah. a lot of guys that, you know, Hall of Famers, and, yeah. and we we were allowed to do whatever we wanted to. Nice. Went nice. to practice, we could go in the huddle, we could do it. Uh, it was pretty cool. Wow. So we, and I, I kind of like him when I'm yeah. seeing. Yeah. Yeah. We were, he was friends with Runner, you know, you know, I don't know, after your time, is that what there's runners there then, right? Runner there, the guy yeah. with the ball, you know, with the oh, and everything. You mean Run Run Jones? Yeah, Run Run Jones, runner. Yeah, so he did yeah. all that stuff. And, oh, you, know, oh, you got a lot from <laughs> Run Run? Well, he, used to, he was invited to the locker room one time. Really? Through, run, through Runner. So, oh, why don't you come in and help me? Because we were at the hotel. You know, so we would go see that and we would Run see Run had a, he had a way, man. Yeah, he loved them. He, and then we, he, we met Al a couple of times when we were out there. Did you so, good? Yeah, it was really, Well, he really would love, Al Davis would right. love this, He's Run Run would He's love this. Strong. Actually, two of the plays occurred during the same game, believe it or not. Um, it was a special game. The Raiders were playing the Washington Redskins in RFK Stadium, and both teams were very powerful teams. Uh, in fact, they played each other a few months later in the Super Bowl. Uh, in this particular game, the Raiders were losing 10-0 in the second quarter. Uh, Washington punted to the Raiders, and the Raiders um, 
began their drive at their own one yard line, backs against the wall. So while the Raiders were in the huddle, I'm talking to my, to my buddies and also saying to other people sitting around me, I said, Jim Plunkett's going to throw a bomb to Cliff Branch and it's going to be a 99 yard touchdown right here, right now. Would you know it? They hike the ball, Plunkett fades back, throws a bomb to Cliff Branch down the left sideline. Bingo, touchdown, 99 yards. What a special moment. Uh, later in that game, uh, classic game by the way, Raiders are up 28 to 20. And again, Washington is punting the ball. And who was the player? Greg Pruitt. Greg Pruitt was a running back uh, returning punts. He fielded the punt at the three yard line and ran 97 yards for a punt return. So two really special plays in the same game. That put the Raiders up 35-20. Unfortunately, they couldn't hold on to the lead and they lost 37-35 uh, in the last few seconds, but just a classic game. Uh, the third special play was the very next year uh, in the Orange Bowl, the Raiders were playing the Miami Dolphins. It was Dan Marino's rookie season. Um, the Raiders were the defending Super Bowl champions, being that they beat the Redskins the year before in the Super Bowl. And Miami was going to the Super Bowl that year. So another powerful game. So in that game, first quarter, it's nothing, nothing. Dan Marino uh, tries to throw a touchdown pass to Mark Clayton, I believe it was. But um, Mike Haynes intercepted the ball at the Raiders one or two yard line. And he ran about 98 yards the other way for an interception return. So three incredible plays. The Raiders actually won that game 45 to 34. So two wonderful games against powerful teams and it was a pleasure to watch. What can I say? I mean that's day, I mean I when I set 1971, the Alameda Coliseum was kind of cool. You know because there was no of these luxury stadiums. But what we got now there's not a free agent in the world that wouldn't want to come play for the Raiders. That's really important. The A's are leaving too, you know. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. It's a move that had to be made. I well, guess, right? yeah, I mean, it, the, the Raiders just, you know, Oakland, I just can't imagine with all the wealth in that East Bay, they couldn't go to other cities and say, hey, man, we got to keep the Raiders here. But you can't play in that stadium anymore. I'd have to say uh, about 10 years ago, this is definitely the best one. There were six or se seven other guys other than myself. We did a 10 day vacation to the West Coast. Uh, we flew to San Francisco, uh, spent about three days there. Unfortunately, we saw the Raiders lose to the Saints. I think it was 38-17. Uh, that was the only downer of the whole trip. Uh, after that, we went to Las Vegas for three or four days and had a marvelous time. Uh, my friend Craig got us tickets to see uh, Chris Angel. We also had great seats to a Cirque du Soleil show. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, on another day, my friend George and I, we rented a red Camaro convertible. And you should see this guy in this convertible. This guy is tall and big, hardly fit into the seat, but it was, what a great, what, what a fun day that was. We just rode through the desert, took a tour of Hoover Dam, went to Lake Mead, had lunch on the lake, and it was just a wonderful day. Then we flew back to San Francisco for about three more days and had gotten tickets to a Monday night football game at Candlestick Park between the 49ers and the Bears. So um, I took a little risk during that game. 
The Raiders and 49ers have a not so friendly relationship, their fans, because of geographically they're so close. And I decided to wear a Raider outfit to that game and that might not have been the best decision. I took a little bit of heat, <laughs> but it's all in good fun. <laughs> Nothing physical, just a lot of verbal abuse. What was the toughest offensive lineman? Do you have like three offensive linemen? Because you played the linebacker position. Yeah. The toughest that you've ever had to deal with. Who's the guy in the Patriots? What's his name? John Hanna. John Hanna. John Hanna. He's a whole. John Hanna. John Hanna. Just Patriots. You know who was the the most offensive offensive lineman I ever was around? Okay. Bob Brown. Bob, what? Bob Brown. Bob Brown. He just died last week. Okay. Yeah. I met him because he came with the Raiders his last three years. Who did he play for? He played for the Eagles. Eagles. Bob Brown. All, yeah. Hall of Fame. All pro. Okay. The best offensive tackle. You know, we had Art Shell. We had John Vela. There were, there were so many. But Bob Brown was so physical. I'm a Cowboy fan. You guys said I'm a Cowboy fan today. I'm a Cowboy fan today. Tom Landry's Cowboys. Who do you feel was the toughest matchup for you when you played the Cowboys on that team? Well, I used to have to go up, go up against Gene Fugit, Billy, G, Billy, Billy Joe Dupree. Billy Joe Dupree, the great, the great tight end. Now, when, when he broke on a, on a, on a route, were you responsible most of the time for the tight end? Or? No. If he went out, it was mine. And if he went in, he was okay. strong safety. Okay. You know, and then, then when you have a zone, you if he comes yeah, in absolutely. in your zone, you. Billy Joe Dupree was yeah, huge. It was about six five five. Was it Drew Pearson? I mean, what what other Cowboy receivers were, were you were you basically aligned against when you, when you were playing? Drew Pearson. Drew Pearson. Okay. Tony Hill. Okay. Tony Hill. And. Don't think I'm a big cowboy fan by any means. I could give a shit about any of those people. I just have to remember a couple. I only like Raiders. Here's, here's, here's the admiration. I only like Raiders. Don't talk about the Chiefs. Don't talk about Denver. Only the Raiders. Here's the admiration. You played for John Madden, number one. And number two, and number two, and number two, and number two, and number two I have to have admiration for Tom Landry, and I'll leave it there. Tom Landry. The Who would you rather play for, Tom Landry or John Madden? That's a tough call. They were both brilliant head coaches. A great coach. But John Madden, of course, John Madden was the was. You the saw guy. him as the announcer, and okay. the, the fun. Yes. Yes. And the, and it, you know, like John was special. Now, Tom Landry with the tie and jacket and the hat. Stoic, okay. I'm not so sure we could, none but, of us but, would but, play but, for him. But, but. That was an awesome evening. One of the best nights I've ever had in my life. Um, this is close to 20 years ago now, about 20 years ago. Uh, we went to Indianapolis to see the Raiders and Colts, and we're eating in a steakhouse on Saturday night. We always went to these fine steakhouses on Saturday nights because many times you run into players, you run into coaches, so it's a nice venue to meet, to meet them. So I see in a corner room, the door was ajar, and I peeked in and I see some of the Raider coaches, and I just peeked my head in, and I said, hey guys, good luck tomorrow, enjoy your, enjoy your dinner. Went back to my table. A little while later, I needed to use the restroom. While I was gone, Runner, their equipment, their equipment coach, who I've seen on, many trips prior to that, uh, comes over to our table. He says, listen, we have an issue. We haven't set up the locker room yet, and we need someone to help us out. Usually on a road game, the locker rooms are set up, the visiting locker room is set up on the afternoon prior to the game. But we, the Raiders were unable to have access to the stadium until after 10 or 11 o'clock Saturday night because there were high school playoff games going on, football playoff games going on. So while I was in the restroom, my friend Steve volunteered me to set up to help set up the locker room. 
So I came back from the restroom. They filled me in on the news, wonderful news. I met Runner at the Raiders Hotel after dinner. We get in the back of a police car, a police escort takes us to the RCA Dome. And the last playoff game was not over yet. It was the fourth quarter. So I'm literally sitting in the end zone watching, watching a high school playoff game. The game ends, time to go to work. The trucks unload all, all the players' bags. Uh, first thing I did was put up magnetic stickers on top of the lockers. And there was a system to it. The offensive linemen go here, the defensive linemen go here, different, uh, you know, the running backs go here. The reason behind that, I guess, is because the players are in com common positions, they can talk strategy while they're dressing up prior to the game. So, and the coaches can coach them while they're dressing up. So then I took the duffel bags, which had numbers on the duffel bags. First thing I had to do was take the duffel bags and match the numbers on the bag to the stickers on top of the locker. Then opened all the bags and set everything up, everything from from helmets to jock straps, set the entire locker up. Uh, I didn't do it by myself. They also recruited another Raider fan uh, who came from Buffalo for the game. So him and I became friends. We, we kept in touch for a few years after that. Um, then after the, after the locker room was, was set up, I went to the training room and helped the trainers uh, stock supplies. After that, I set up the Gatorade stands on the field. After that, we're done. I take a police uh, escort back to the hotel. Uh, I'm saying goodnight to Runner. He says to me, well, you want to have a couple of beers as a nightcap? I said, sure. 2.30 in the morning, we're at the bar, and who's there? Gerald Irons. He was a Raider linebacker during the same time that Phil Villapiano played. And wow, and I shouted out his name when I walked over to the bar, and man, did I make his day. He was so thrilled that I recognized him. The smile on his face, and the reason why he was on the trip was his son was a member of the Raiders that year, and he fought, and he went joined the team on road trips. So, got home, at, got back to my room at 3:30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and hardly slept a wink. It was just a just an incredible evening. We come we come in we come in off the golf course. It's like four foursomes of Raiders, and Gene Upshaw was right next to me, who was the captain of the team. So we're walking up the steps, and the pro is out. He's like this, what the fuck? And we're like, what's the man? He goes, Al Davis is in on our television, telling all of Oakland that you guys are moving to LA. Uh, I, that's how it got announced. Gene Upshaw didn't even know. Unbelievable. So now, we go in That's and we'll, we listen to the rest of the, you know, his uh, statement. Yeah. Then we're playing Liar's Face. We're drinking. Dave Dalby, our center, is having a barbecue. We go back to his house. By the time the, the, and the Tribune found us, I was like the last guy to get interviewed. And I was fucking drunk. <laughs> I was fucking livid. I couldn't. So I I'm went, sure, yeah. I was fucking, upset when you guys moved down there. Everybody was upset. So I said, this is wrong. Why is it always got to be all about money? I mean, yeah. well, I didn't, Good for you, though. Well, I said, speak your heart. The next day, the headline was, Philip Piano won't go. So I guess I said, I'm not going. You don't say that. To yeah, Davis. yeah, yeah. So two years later, when it came oh. time to move, he got me. Wow. He never forgot. Wow, wow, wow. He never forgot. Well, today there are 17 games versus 14 years ago. Uh, more teams can make it to the playoffs, so more teams have a chance to get into the postseason than years ago. <clears throat> um, other changes, years ago players did not have freedom to move from one team to another. 
Uh, eventually, free agency came into play, and salary caps came into play, and that changed the entire uh, strategy of especially general managers who have to make decisions related to these issues. <coughs> so, um, years back, teams were able to hold on to players uh, for much longer periods of time because the players did not have the freedom to move from one team to another as they do today through free agency and other rules. So, these days it's harder much more difficult for because of free agency and salary cap issues, etc. It's much harder to hold on to key players. Uh, so there's a lot more player movement going on today than there was when I was growing up. Uh, also, back in the day, um, it was a much more dangerous game, especially for quarterbacks and wide receivers and tight ends. These were players that, a majority of the time, these are the players that are carrying the football, and these are the players that the defensive people want to hit and tackle, and these are the players that were most exposed on the field by themselves, so they were prone to taking the most vicious hits and succumbing to major injuries. So there's been a lot of rule changes to protect the receivers and the quarterbacks. Uh, and as a result, uh, scoring has increased because these players are now can roam around the field and not worry so much. And they can't be hit um, in certain ways as before. Also helmets uh, have become much safer than years ago um, to protect against concussions, CTE, and other brain injuries, neck injuries, spinal injuries, etc. The league is very conscious of player safety these days. And there was a time not long ago where uh, athletes would consider going into other sports as opposed to football because they were concerned about their quality of life after retirement. For example, a baseball player, after retirement, he's alone on a field. He's not taking the hits like a football player is. So uh, that was another uh, main reason to make player sa safety a high priority in the league. So but I, I caught a game in L.A. I went for like 10 days. What was it, like 19, like 1990, when Bo Jackson was on the team. We saw at the LA Coliseum Raiders, Seahawks, yeah. and then the next week we saw Raiders, Chargers. I was up in Seattle, the one where Bo Jackson ran, it was Monday night, he the, ran, uh, and ran out the end zone. Yeah. He was flying. That was all, that yeah. was the, the big game between Bo and Paz. Um, right. Bosworth? Yes. Number 55. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was some game. That, Raiders yeah. kicked the shit they out They kicked the shit out of him that night. Yeah. And you were underdogs that night. Were we? I think so. Well, I was I, I was well, all I'm done. I'm not sure that Bo was there. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know, but I was all done at the time. As soon as I, the money changed hands with the ticket, with, with this guy, a plain clothes guy from the right behind me, grabs me by the wrist. He says, okay, you MF'er, let's get in the bus. They put me in one of those criminal buses, oh, fingerprinted. No. Ruined what your day. What? Oh, it was a great day. They let you out? Well, either I plead not guilty and stay overnight for a hearing Monday, or pay $50 and plead guilty. Soliciting on public space. Okay. You know? And the only reason why, I was having a great time in the precinct. I was not the first bus load in. The, the precinct was packed, you know? So I'm livid, not because I'm, I'm in the process of being arrested. I'm pissed because I didn't see my friend. That dog probably got his ticket and got in, <laughs> you know? Then about yeah. 10 minutes later, I hear people laughing. You know, there's commotion going on, and I'm trying to see what's going on. 
I see through the window. Oops, here comes another bus load. And my friend was on the next bus. Really? Yeah. So he was taken away. He was taken away. So yeah. after we got out of the precinct, we took the subway back to the airport. We had like five hours to kill for the flight back. And we got back for the fourth quarter of the Raider game. And then we saw the four o'clock game, Rams 40, 49ers. Yeah. And we were just drinking all afternoon. What a great, young, what a great, and I young, have that yeah. in the garage. I have the citation in the garage. Do you? Cool. Maybe I'll take a picture of it. I'll send it to Terry. Yeah, that's fine. Future goals as a Raider fan, number one, uh, because of COVID and personal health issues, I have not gone uh, to any Raider games over the last five or six years where um, doing a road trip was an annual uh, situation. So I plan to be doing more road trips now. And also when I had my ribbon cutting ceremony in my garage, when I met Phil Villapiano, he brought along a wonderful woman named Terry Russell, who is the president of the New Jersey Booster Raiders fan club. And I'm going to be meeting with her over the next month or two to see what's involved about me possibly beginning a local Raiders boost, Booster Club up on Long Island and in Queens. So those are the two uh, changes I look forward to. Uh, well, I think I'm gonna start with Phil Villapiano. He was a linebacker for the Raiders during most of the 1970s, and he was just a tough guy. Um, he talked a lot of smack. He was physical, he was tough. Uh, really liked his style and even after retirement through today he's always had a, a a wonderful passion for the Raiders he's a wonderful storyteller he's still deeply connected to the team and it's just a pleasure to listen to him uh, on interviews to hear him talk about his experiences as a player he's truly a wonderful individual um, and an excellent player, and he was an important reason why the Raiders had so much success during that decade. Uh, another favorite player of mine, the next two players are actually quarterbacks. One was Ken Stabler. Uh, the first reason I liked him, because he's a lefty, as am I. Uh, but there's just something about him. Uh, he was so cool and calm and collected under pressure. Uh, there were many situations where the Raiders were in a tight game or losing in the fourth quarter, and that's where he thrived and played his best ball. He'd get into the huddle, uh, and that this calmness and coolness just uh, filtered throughout the huddle, and his plays uh, uh, didn't get rattled because he was so calm. And most times they would pull the games out and he was just, just, just the coolness and the calmness that he showed on the field. It was, uh, it was, it was great to see and wonderful to root for a person like that. Uh, my third player was Jim Plunkett. Um, his story, he was a Heisman Trophy winner, played for the Patriots and the 49ers before the Raiders picked them up had horrible experiences. Uh, the offensive lines on those two teams were horrible and he got totally beaten up. He contemplated retirement. Um, Al Davis, the owner of the Raiders, was looking for another quarterback and there's just something he saw in Jim and he talked him out of retirement on more than one occasion and signed him up. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jim won two Super Bowls for the Raiders. And what the interesting story about that is, both of those years where he won Super Bowls, he was the second string quarterback when the game started, when the season started. And the only reason why he was elevated to the starter is because the starters in both of those years, Dan Pastorini and Mark Wilson, uh, were injured. Uh, in certain games and 
Jim was elevated to, to be the starter, and he played so well that he remained the starter for the rest of the year. The team responded behind him. They just loved him as an individual, and his career was just resurrected and had two marvelous years, and um, he won two Super Bowls for them. By the way, uh, not many people know this, but Jim's parents were blind, so he grew up in a household with blind parents. So, just something to share. Finn. So, Craig mentioned an ESPN story. We see the Raiders play the Ravens one year down in Baltimore. Raiders lost a close game, I think 13 10 or something. We're in the parking lot. I'm all decked out. Raiders are in the park. We go to the parking lot, go back to the car. I see, we see a cameraman and a guy with a microphone. They call me over. They're asking me questions for a few minutes. Great interview. Then over the next couple of weeks, I'm getting calls from different people who didn't know each other. Jay, were you in Baltimore last weekend? Yeah. Well, I saw you on ESPN. And then we left. We got in the car. His face, he was taking off all his paint. My brand new car, he was getting everything all over the car. We get back to home, and I was telling some of our fraternity brothers about what happened. And one of our guys said, let's call Jay and say he was on ESPN. And he was interviewed. So all of a sudden, Jay's getting calls from 20 and 30 different guys saying, Jay, we just saw you on ESPN. They interviewed you at the Baltimore game. And he's going crazy. He's watching ESPN. He can't find it. He can't find it. He can't find it. So after a while, he calls ESPN. He's on the phone with ESPN. So I start calling ESPN. And uh, I'm saying, listen, I'm, I got people calling me saying I'm on ESPN. And uh, Oh, there's no, we have no record of that. We have no record of that. But all my friends are telling me, you're on ESPN. So make a long story longer. I kept calling and calling and calling over weeks, over weeks, getting more agitated each time. So it turns out they just pulled the practical joke. I mean, I was never on ESPN. I was probably like on the Baltimore Channel 8 evening news. Went to New Year's Eve party. Tell them, well, we saw you all over. At the end of the party, we said, Jim, you were never on TV. They never played it. So that went on for about a year. It was a, 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 very, good, uh, a very good time to uh, play his games. Uh, without any thought, my favorite piece, and will always be my favorite piece, was a needlepoint that my mom made 49 or 50 years ago. Uh, it was a needlepoint uh, that has an eyeball, a heart, and below that, a large Raider helmet. I love Raiders. And um, my mom and I would sit on the couch for several evenings a week watching our favorite shows on TV while she was doing the needlepoint. It took her months to complete it. Uh, in the beginning, she was very, very determined to do it and she was enjoying the job. But as the weeks went on, she was starting to get more bored and she started to complain a little bit. But I told her, Mom, I love you, but just finish the damn thing. Don't stop now. So, and for all these years, I've had it hanging up every day for the last 50 years. And the colors are just as bright as it was the day she made it. I always made it a point to hang it up in a room where it was never exposed to sunlight. And that's how it retained its vibrancy. So that's a very special uh, part of my life. Uh, the second uh, favorite memorabilia is something that I received very recently. It was an autographed Raiders football from Phil Villapiano, my favorite player. Um, he signed it to Jay, Phil Villapiano, Super Bowl XI, and it was an engraved Raiders football alternating white and brown sides uh, with the Raider logo in, uh, engraved in it with uh, the three Raider Super Bowl years with, the, with you know, Super Bowl XI with the, with the final score, Super Bowl XV with Super Bowl XVIII with the final score. So I have that in a wonderful case right now. And, that's probably my second favorite 
uh, piece of memorabilia because I met him personally and it was a very nice thing he did. Phil will always like your style of play since you became the AFC Defensive Rookie of the Year in 1971. You were always one of my favorite players, but you became my absolute number one guy during the first quarter of the Super Bowl XI versus the Vikings. The score was nothing, nothing, and Ray Guy gets his first ever punt blocked at the Raiders three yard line. On second down, you blast Brent McCallanhan near the goal line. His body flew one way, the ball flew the other way, and Willie Hall recovered. That play totally changed the mood of the game, and you guys won 30, 32 to 14. That play ranks. That play ranks very high on my list as the most important play in Raider history. I vividly remember myself going wild after that play. Phil, thanks for being the major reason why I'm devoted to this wonderful organization. Thank you. Hmm, where do I start? Uh, I think I'm going to start uh, during the 1976 season because that's the year they won their first Super Bowl. Uh, their first playoff game was against the New England Patriots and I had an uneasy feeling about this game because the Raiders were 13-1 and that year. Their only loss was to the Patriots and they got demolished 48-10, to 48-17. to 17. So I knew it wasn't going to be an easy game. Uh, the game was out in Oakland and going into the fourth quarter, the Raiders are losing 21 to 10. So I'm really stressed out and I'm saying, here we go again. The Raiders were so close for so many years, had so many good teams for the 10 years prior to that, in the playoffs just about every year, and one team or another would always knock them out. So here we go again. But Ken Stabler, Mr. Cool, engineered two touchdown drives in the fourth quarter and they scored the winning touchdown with about a minute left and they won that game 24 to 21. Uh, the next week was the AFC Championship game to get to the Super Bowl and they were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers who they had a uh, brutal rivalry with uh, over a few years prior to that. The games were so, so physical and the Raiders needed to get over the hump. Uh, three of the last, three of the four years prior to that, the Steelers eliminated the Raiders. Uh, the two years immediately prior to that game, the Steelers beat the Raiders to get to the Super Bowl. And a couple of years before that was the infamous Franco Harris Immaculate Reception. Uh, so a lot of pressure on that game for the Raiders to win. And they performed wonderfully. They won the game very easily. They won 24 to seven. So the monkey was off my back, off their backs, and they got to the Super Bowl. But still, there was a lot of pressure because I wanted them to win the Super Bowl. But in addition to that, they were playing the Minnesota Vikings. My brother was a big Viking fan back at that time. So God forbid, I lose to his team. So, uh, first quarter, the score is zero to zero. The Raiders are punting. Ray Guy is their punter. He's the only punter to ever make it to the Hall of Fame as a punter. And going into this particular kick, he never, ever, ever had a punt blocked until that moment. He gets the punt blocked. Minnesota recovers the ball at the two yard line. And I'm saying, ah, uh, trouble. So Phil Villapiano and the, the, the defensive unit get on the field. Phil tells his teammates in the huddle, all right, guys, we got him just where we want him. No problem. Two plays later, Phil bursts through the line, hits Brett McClanahan, the Viking running back. Ball goes one way, Brent goes the other way. Willie Hall, another Raider linebacker, falls on the ball. The Raiders go 90 yards the other way, and the rest is history. Instead of them being down 7-0, the Raiders are in the lead, set the tone for the whole game, and they became world champions 32-14. By the way, 
halftime of that game. Well, let me mention something else. I was forced to watch that game up in my bedroom on a little black and white TV. My two older brothers were sitting downstairs in the living room on the big color TV. But I didn't want to sit with them. I had to be by myself. So, without my knowledge, my brothers planted a tape recorder underneath my bed to record me in case the Raiders lost. So halftime, oh, the Raiders won, so there was no use. That, that tape went immediately in the garbage, no use for it. But at halftime, Raiders were winning 16 to nothing. I went downstairs for a snack and to visit my brothers. I sit on the couch next to them, and I figured my brother's really upset, I'm not gonna rub it in. I'm gonna be, you know, mature and not mention anything. So with that, my brother starts punching me in the arm, saying, don't act mature like that. I know how you're feeling inside. Don't act as if, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're not thrilled. So he punched me a few times, went up, watched the end of the game, and had a nice black and blue off for a few days. So that was the 1976 season. Uh, 1980 season, when they had their run to the second Super Bowl. Uh, their first playoff game was against the Houston Oilers and there was a lot of stress leading up to that game because prior to that season the Raiders traded Kenny Stabler to the Houston Oilers and on this day Stabler is coming back to Oakland to try to beat them in a playoff game so I we can't have that happen as it turns out the Raider defense totally dominated the game and made things very uncomfortable for him. And the Raiders won 27 to seven. Uh, another game that brings back uh, great memories was the very next week, they went to Cleveland to play the Browns. The temperature was about three degrees, very windy, wind chills like 20, 25 below. Fourth quarter, Raiders are up 14 to 12. Cleveland is driving in the last couple of minutes to try to win the game. They're maybe 10 yards away from, from winning the game. They had an opportunity to kick a winning field goal to win the game 15-14. But during their timeout, the Cleveland coach decided not to kick the field goal because of the poor weather conditions. Their kicker missed two field goals already. And they didn't want to put them in that situation. So they decided to run a play and throw a pass in the end zone. Amazingly, the Raiders intercepted the ball, game over. And they advanced to the title game, ended up winning the Super Bowl. The last playoff game was uh, several years before that in the mid 70s, 70, 74, 75 against the Miami Dolphins. And that game was labeled the sea of hands game. The reason why it was labeled that was the Raiders are losing. Wonderful game. Back and forth the whole, the whole game. Very entertaining. Raiders are losing 26-21. Final drive of the game. Raiders are getting close. So on third or fourth down, Stable is trying to throw a pass in the end zone. And he's getting tackled. His body is almost horizontal, almost ready to hit the ground. And he just throws the ball right before he lands on the ground. The ball is just wobbling, floating into the end zone. Clarence Davis, their running back, is in the end zone with four dolphins circling all around him. So there's 10 hands reaching for the ball. And Clarence ends up with, with the ball, amazingly. And they win the game 28-26. Unfortunately, they lost the next week, but that was still an unbelievable play. And that's my, those are my favorites. Very good, Jay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, I don't know who called me to come here, but it was, you know, you think about uh, the, what she, what she told me. Phil, this is NFL. We're going to have television. We're going to have radio. NFL wants to do this. We 
We got this guy, Jay. He's got a garage full of stuff. This is going to be good. She went on and on and on. I went, you, you didn't have to say all that, but it was, but you did it. It was, it was fun. And it's good to meet you guys. And what a nice group. I, I had no, no clue what to expect, except when I do Raider stuff, it's always, it's always different and it's always good. And I just was lucky, very lucky to be, get drafted in 71, right when the Raiders were getting started. And right when they had that, uh, that crazy mystique about, you know, and it was, there was nothing fake about it. And I was, um, well, I, I knew I wanted to be a Raider be just the way they played football. But it was Thanksgiving, and I came, I was at Bowling Green, and you know, we got done our season, I come home, and the Raiders are playing the Lions, which they used to do, do a lot on Thanksgiving. The Lions always, the Raiders. So they were, they were trying this new thing where they mic'd up the coaches. This was 1970. They mic'd up the coaches on the sideline, and here's the opening kickoff. I couldn't wait. We went and saw the high school play and then like four o'clock game or something. And they, they kicked off and the, the coaches were mic'd. And what I heard as those guys ran down the field, get that mother, get that mother, blah, blah, screaming, yelling profanity. My mother stood up and said, that team is disgusting. I walked out of the TV room. She wouldn't watch the Raiders. And I'm like, I love those guys. I put, put me on that team, baby. So it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, and it, we, it, you, you reminded me of something pretty cool before, Jay. So, it, you know, now I'm played at Bowling Green and I got invited to go to the Blue Gray game. Okay, back, that was a big deal. If you're a college senior, and I go there, and I, just, I couldn't wait to play. I just couldn't wait to play. And we, the defense goes on the field first. We stop them, and now they're going to punt. I came off the side. I slapped the fucking punt down. The ball goes back up, and flag comes in. And I'm like, well, somebody, somebody just screwed up. My best play of my life was on national television. We hype, we get down again. Uh, you know, so, no. Then they get a first down. Then we stopped them. They're going to punt again. Shoot, I'm off the side. Slap the punt. <laughs> I blocked two punts in the first quarter. The referee came over to me and goes, hey, there's no punt blocking in the blue gray game. <laughs> I'm like, what? So they got another first down. And, uh, oh God, the, the, the head coach uh, with the Bobby Bowden. Just win, baby.